I'm not actually going to do a talk here. This is really going to be in your imagination rather than a talk. So, so what I want you to imagine is that tomorrow morning, when you wake up, you know, normally when you wake up, you kind of roll over like this, and then you leap out of bed like one of those people in the mattress ads. Well, tomorrow morning, you wake up and you roll over like this, except your right arm doesn't come with you, it stays behind. And you realize something is wrong. And then you realize you can't feel your arm properly. So you want to call out your partner and say, honey, I think I've got a problem. So you call out, my, my voice. So you try again. You're getting quite panicky at this point. So you, you get yourself out of the bed and you get your left leg on the ground and then the right leg you've got to kind of pull and you, it, as it hits the ground, collapses under you and you crash to the floor. Make sufficient noise to now eventually alert your partner to the fact that there's a bit of a problem. Partner comes along and the next thing you know you're in hospital and they checking you out and a uh, doctor comes along and investigates and says, how many fingers can you see? Touch your finger, touch your nose. They put you into a brain scanner and they check all sorts of things with you. And then they leave you and you just lie there and for some hours nothing happens. You don't know what's going on. And later that afternoon, a doctor comes through and he says, in an utterly monotonic, bland voice, Good afternoon. You've had an ischemic uh, cerebrovascular accident in the distribution of the left middle cerebral artery, and it's caused right hemiparesis and aphasia. You have a large infarct in your brain. And you think, well, thanks for explaining so clearly to me <laughs> what's going on. Anyway, they put you into ICU for a few days, and then a few days later they transfer you through to the rehab hospital up the road. And there you referred to go and see a neuropsychologist. A neuropsychologist? So psychologist? Why can't these people have names you can pronounce? <laughs> so anyway, you end up going to see this neuropsychologist. And the neuropsychologist engages in a conversation with you and he says, you've basically got three options here in terms of recovery because, and somebody so eventually tells you that you had a stroke, says either the damage in your brain is just going to heal by itself, um, which will be great, and then you'll be healed and everything will be fine, or if the, the, the doesn't heal by itself, then whatever problems you've got now are going to be with you forever. So that's not very reassuring. It says, or your second option is that neurogenesis will happen and you'll grow new little nerves in your brain. Except that the odds of neurogenesis happening, in fact, are slim because typically that only happens in people who are less than about two years of age. So mm, a toppy like you, it's not going to uh, happen. So the other option is that neuroplasticity takes place in your brain. And what is neuroplasticity? Well, this is when healthy nerves take over the function of damaged nerves. And they, they kick in and restoration happens indirectly by means of neuroplasticity. And he says, I happen to have a little box that we believe promotes neuroplasticity. You think, wow, that's interesting to hear. That's the best news I've had for some days. Tell me more. And he says, well, this is something called vagal nerve stimulation. And vagal nerve stimulation is a treatment that has been around for some decades. It is an FDA-approved treatment for depression and for epilepsy. Previously, it has always required surgery. We cut open your neck, we expose the vagal nerve, and we put a clamp on it, and we stimulate it in that way. What you should know about the vagal nerve is that it is the nerve that connects your brain to your gut. It goes to your heart, it goes to your liver, to your kidneys, to your gastrointestinal tract. And it 
performs all sorts of important functions in terms of this coordination between gut and brain. Amongst others, it helps to modulate the balance between the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. What? So the sympathetic nervous system is the system that when you get a fright, when you're in fear, when you have fight-flight response, that kicks in. It's the freak-out system. It drives your heart rate up. The vagal nerve sends a signal to your kidneys. They pump out adrenaline. You get all hyped up. The other system, the parasympathetic system, is the chill-out system. That's the relax system. And there's a balance between the two. Okay. So, I want to just you to imagine, yet again, another bit of imagination that you need to do. I want you to imagine at this point that I am actually the neuropsychologist uh, in, in uh, being discussed here, uh, because I just want to talk in the first person, it's a little less schizophrenic. So, I came across a paper dealing with vagal nerve stimulation. I've previously not paid much attention to vagal st nerve stimulation because it, w it required surgery, it was an invasive procedure, so mm, it's kind of not on my radar. But this was a paper saying that it was beneficial for people with post-traumatic stress disorder. I happen to have numerous patients with post-traumatic stress disorder, almost an incidental problem uh, with the people that I'm dealing with, but often they've gone through significant trauma. I was sufficiently intrigued by this to buy the equipment and wanted to try it. And I had a patient who was a physical instructor who'd had a serious brain injury, a, a very big man, but who was hyper vigilant and, and anxious. And he was, in fact, freaked out. His freak out system was hyper, hyper activated because he was terrified of the hallucinations that he'd had while he was in. ICU. And it was a problem in terms of the treatment that he needed to get. It was a problem in terms of doing a diagnostic evaluation on the guy because he was so fearful. So we did vagal nerve stimulation with him. This just required a little electrode attached to his ear to this little gizmo about the size of a cell phone. We do the vagal nerve stimulation. I see him, uh, my team runs with the, 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 the uh, treatment. I see him about a week later. And he says to me, you know, by the way, the anxiety that I was feeling is just gone. It's gone. I was like, wow, okay, that's very interesting. But I'm, I'm, a, I'm a skeptic. I really am um, very cautious about anything that, mm, any claim to kind of miracle cure. And, and there's an element to this vagal nerve stimulation stuff that smacks of, of miracle cure. So I think, well, I mean, is this just like a placebo effect, for example? Anyway, we do it with more and more patients, and we're getting very similar re results, particularly with people who are anxious at any rate. Then there's another person that comes along who comes from a different angle. This guy uh, has atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is a cardiac problem, so where your heart normally goes do dum, do dum, do dum. With atrial fibrillation, your heart goes do dum, do dum, do dum, do dum, do dum. So, actually, when your heart's doing this, it's pretty terrifying, and you're like you're about to die. So it's it's a, and and he's had AF atrial fibrillation for for some years. He's he's skeletally thin, um, and and in serious health trouble. And his cardiologist had suggested to him that he has vagal nerve stimulation, and he heard that I was doing this non-invasive form of this. So. Long story short, we, we see him and we do the, the vagal nerve stimulation. The treatment protocol that we've got planned out is three weeks, half an hour every day of this stimulation. We start on the Monday and that evening, the rest of the day, he has no episodes of, of AF. He's been having these episodes frequently every few days. Now it stopped. We did it for the rest of the week. There were no episodes. Then we broke over the weekend. Uh, on the Saturday night, what happens? He has an episode. Start the same process again. Um, the, the following week, exactly the same pattern unfolds. If he has the, the vagal nerve stimulation, VNS, he doesn't have an episode of AF. Okay. By the end of the week, he was so 
thrilled with the outcome that he actually purchased all of the equipment from me and said, thank you very much, I want to be able to do this at home rather than having to come in all the time. And for me, that was, a, that was certainly conclusive proof that something was happening in your brain. This was not a placebo effect. Then a paper appeared in The Lancet, which is a preeminent medical journal in 2021, describing how VNS used with stroke patients resulted in better outcome. The stroke patients all receive the same rehabilitation, but in the group that has VNS, there's a much better outcome. And there are all sorts of measures that we use to monitor how we're doing in rehab and the outcome that we're getting. And this, this paper shows, and it's a very carefully controlled clinical trial. Every box that needs to be ticked to define a, a good clinical trial was ticked. It was superb work. And they, they, they effectively, definitively demonstrate the efficacy of vagal nerve stimulation in stroke rehabilitation. There's still lots of black boxes in my head in terms of understanding this. And in particular, what's, what's actually happening in here? And for me, one of the, the kind of aha moments came when I came across a paper dealing with cochlear implants. Now, this has got nothing to do with uh, VNS whatsoever, and uh, it's of personal interest to me. I have a hearing problem. I think that one day I might need cochlear implants myself. So when I come across something about this, I, I read it. And this, this paper was describing a group of little rats where they do cochlear implants in the rats, and the rats that had the implant are able to navigate in the environment uh, better after the, uh, uh, the, the surgery than uh, those that don't. Now, they, they stimulate one area of the brain, something called the locus ceruleus. And the locus ceruleus is an area involved in neuroplasticity. That, that, w that kind of was the aha thing for me, because I happen to know uh, from a lot of reading that it does that anyway. And then reading more about the anatomy of the vagal nerve itself, and I've had to learn a huge amount, that told me that the vagal nerve actually sends a projection from your ear to something called the nucleus tractus solitarius in your brain, a little nucleus there, and from there to the locus ceruleus. So two synapses from your ear is a center in your brain that plays a major role in neuroplasticity. So this treatment basically promotes neuroplasticity. Let's just step back here for a second and think about what I'm, I'm telling you here. I'm telling you that, let's go back to where I started, stroke. It might seem like a remote possibility. I looked up something the other day. The World Stroke Organization estimate that 25% of adults will have a stroke at some point in their life. Just let that sink in. This is not some slim chance of this happening. There's a real chance it can happen to you. This treatment has huge potential. We've been using it in a range of different conditions. It turns out to be uh, helpful for inflammatory conditions. So it's been used with rheumatoid arthritis. It's been used with Crohn's disease, irritable bowel syndrome. We're using it with Parkinson's disease. We're using it in spinal cord injury. We're using it outside of the clinical context, elderly people to stimulate their brains, to promote cognitive functioning, to improve memory. Vagal nerve stimulation is coming into the picture. It, it is an absolutely revolutionary treatment that has suddenly become available because it's no longer the preserve of surgery, it's no longer leaned for extreme conditions, and because it is so easily applied, we are able to use it in such a, a wide range of conditions and we can try it out. And effectively, it has no known side effects, so it's just remarkably brilliant to use because we're not causing damage to people. The machine is powered by three little AAA batteries. It's as gentle and as delicate as you could be. There's some catches. The catch is that neuroplasticity, understand, is something that happens in your brain all the time. For all of you, every day of your life, neuroplasticity is, is happening. It's the basis of learning. If we don't do VNS in a controlled kind of way, there is a potential for things to go wrong. If you are significantly depressed, for example, and we just do vagal nerve stimulation, well, it, 
it makes your brain more malleable, more open to suggestion in a sense. So there's the potential that you become even more depressed rather than getting better. You're going to learn depression. Okay. There are some conditions like complex regional pain syndrome, which is a terrible condition, which is effectively really an example of neuroplasticity gone awry. That's when neuroplasticity is doing its own thing in an uncontrolled way. But if we control it and we provide the right context for patients receiving the treatment, as we do in the hospital, they get the existing rehab now with at least those where they can afford it and so on, those are getting the, the benefit of VNS as well. They get that much further down the line. So there's, there always needs to be some adjunct context that allows us to tune what's in here and get VNS working appropriately. This is an amazing piece of equipment that you've got in your, 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 your skull, this brain. If we use it suitably and we provide the right kind of context in which this to, for this to unfold, a kind of doctor-patient relationship, you're able to create a, basically a neural symphony with your brain using vagal nerve stimulation to enhance your recovery. It's brilliant. A symphony. Ta-da. Ta-da. Done. Thank you.